Viola Desmond is often referred to as the Canadian Rosa Parks, and yet many don't know the reality of her situation or it's highly glossed over and made to seem as if it was not, not as severe by Canadians. So what really happened to her and how did it affect her personal life? Hi, hello, what is up and welcome or welcome back to Girl You Haven't Heard, the podcast where we discuss true crime and Black Canadian history from a critical, decolonial perspective, but above all else, without all the unnecessary propaganda that others love to include, but we hate to listen to. Okay, this is Black History Month edition, and today we are going to talk about the iconic Viola Desmond. Viola Irene Desmond was born on July 6th, 1914 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was born to an absolutely massive family of 10 siblings. Her parents were well-known, well-respected, and well-loved in the Black community, as were their children. Her dad, James Albert Davis, was a barber, and I couldn't find out what her mother, Gwendolyn Irene Davis, did, but she was the daughter of a minister, so it seemed like they had some generational wealth going on there. Her father was black, and her mother was white. Mixed kids were extremely common, but interracial marriage was not. How is that possible? As black people do, though, they accepted the couple with open arms and their children with open arms and open hearts as well. As a result, they were able to become a prominent figure in the black community, but the white community shunned them more or less. Her parents were extremely successful financially, and they just seemed like a very happy family. They encouraged all of their children to follow in their footsteps in being financially successful, being happy, but above all else, helping their community. Viola wanted to be an independent businesswoman just like her father, and so she began teaching in a segregated school before she was accepted into the Field Beauty Culture School in Montreal. After completing her program there, she went on to study beauty in Atlantic City and New York. After completing all of her schooling and really just thriving, she opened V's School of Beauty Culture in Halifax, which catered to the Black community, but more specifically Black women, as they're career prospects and options were far more restricting than black men. So around the time Viola finished her education, beauty shops, beauty parlors, barber shops really began to take off in popularity in the black community. It was a place that they could peacefully congregate and not really be bothered, hassled, or harassed. It was allowed to be a black space and a black safe space. So this also presented business opportunities for black women to get in there but really thrive in that space in ways that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Barber shops and beauty shops became a staple in the Black community during the early 20th century. It was a place where Black folks could safely gather, educate each other, gossip of course, spill the tea, we love to do that, but also just uplift one another, have fun, and not have to worry about the regular external pressures that were on them, most of which were rooted in racism. I said what I said! Because of her familial status, her education, and her drive to uplift her family, Viola quickly found success because of her hard work. Her beauty school, the Desmond School of Beauty Culture, trained women across the province. Viola would actually go on to create her own line of beauty products, which were sold in a variety of locations, many of which were owned by the very women who had graduated from her school, which I love. It's very like community. Like I'm gonna educate you, but then we're also gonna work together and uplift one another. It's just chef's kiss. So Viola knew that her success could be a vital point in giving back and supporting her community, so she did just that. The school was created to provide training to Black women who were rapidly entering the workforce in new and vibrant ways. It was no longer just housekeeping. Women in Viola's schools were provided with the skills, the training, and the networks to open their own businesses and to hire and support Black women in their own community. A reach one, teach one type situation. Women traveled from across the country to enroll in Viola School, which had at least 15 students graduate every single year. All of the women in her school were actually previously denied admission to white Canadian institutions. Oh, Lord. Segregation and racism were also very real issues at the time, so Viola created exclusively Black spaces for her community to succeed and thrive in the same way that the white communities were. On November 8th, 1946, Viola was heading to Sydney, Nova Scotia for a business meeting, but on her way down there, her car actually broke down in New Glasgow. She took it to a garage, expecting the repairs to take just like a short time, like, oh, maybe I'll just be here for a couple hours, kill some time. But due to the parts that were needed to fix her car, she would have to wait at least a day before she'd be able to leave. 
wait a damn minute so she was like all right whatever there's nothing i can do let me just make the most of my situation let me go and get a hotel room and just stay the night just spend the night there but then it was kind of early still in the day so she got a little bit bored and decided that she was going to take herself down to the roseland theater to see a movie now this particular theater was heavily segregated but it was an unofficial sort of segregation which is very on brand for canadians so the locals knew about it but outsiders would have no clue there was no signage there was nothing letting you know that it was segregated but you just knew okay so white folks were able to get the good seats on the main floor and black folks were forced to sit in the balcony area out of sight out of mind prior to viola going down there there were also very recently two prior incidences of black folks who lived in new glasgow protesting the segregation being discriminated against and they ended up having the cops called on them and being physically removed we discussed this in the prior episode about carrie best so if you don't know what i'm talking about pause this right now go back watch and listen to that podcast episode and then come back to this because the context in there is extremely important for what we're about to get into here viola walked in and she wanted to buy a ticket for the main floor which of course everybody would because that's the best place to sit like when i go to the theater i'm sitting on the main floor okay also because i can't see that well but neither could viola she was nearsighted so sitting on the floor was like a no-brainer for her so that she could actually see what she had paid to see however the ticket seller knew that the theater was segregated so they gave her a balcony ticket without saying anything to her viola then proceeded to walk to the main floor where the ticket taker told her like no 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 you can't sit here you got to go upstairs where your people are supposed to be he told her that her ticket was for the balcony and not the main floor and she would have to go sit up there what? viola was confused she then went to the cashier because at this point she still thought that it was just a genuine honest mistake that had been made she asked to exchange her ticket for a main floor one it was only a one cent price difference so she had no issues paying but also remember she was an extremely successful, established businesswoman, so money was not an issue to her, especially not one, one cent. Like, that was no problem. The cashier then looked at her and said, I'm sorry, but I can't sell downstairs tickets to you people. At this point, everything clicked for Viola. It's like a switch went off, okay? She realized that the space was racially segregated and quote-unquote you people were talking about you black folks. Viola, she was not having any of it, all right? So she went and she decided to sit on the main floor anyways. She's like, I'm not doing this. This is what we're not about to do. Okay, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to watch my movie and you're going to let me. Now, one of the snitch employees just couldn't let our girl see and be great. So he went and got the manager, Henry McNeil, who went and confronted Viola. He told her that the theater had the legal right to refuse admission to any objectionable person. Viola then retorted that she had not been refused admission. She was sold a ticket, which she was literally still holding. So like, nice try. She then told him that she had tried to swap her balcony ticket for a main floor ticket so that she could see, and she had offered to pay the price difference. The ticket seller wouldn't let her. She was then told by Henry that she needed to go to the balcony or leave the theater, and she refused. Then crusty man Henry got quite upset, and he called the cops on her corny lame boo tomato 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 i'm throwing tomatoes the police officers told her to get up and she refused once again they picked her up and they literally dragged her out of the theater they ended up injuring her hip and her knee in this process after assaulting her they took her to jail what? when they got there police chief elmo langille and henry were waiting for her they literally made sure she got there and then they left to go get an arrest warrant for her after she had already been arrested she insisted that they let her out and they refused and she must have been quite scared just due to the racial tensions and also just knowing what being a black woman in prison would result in or could result in like racism hate-based rapes trafficking are real issues that could easily result in her disappearance or her death However, despite her fears and concerns, she put on her brave face and she sat up straight the whole night with her gloves on, her purse in her lap, and her hands on her lap, with a serious look on her face. She would spend 12 hours in jail. The next morning, Viola was taken to court and charged with attempting to defraud the provincial government because Henry and his lying employees said that she refused to pay the one cent price difference. She explained to the judge that she had offered to pay the difference, but her offer was refused. She had to defend herself because she wasn't given a lawyer or even informed that she had the right to have one present. 
it makes me question even if she had requested a lawyer would she have really been given it i really don't think so the judge didn't care he was not trying to hear anything she had to say so he fined her 26 dollars, and six of that was to go directly to henry for what reason is unclear it's clear that this was a case of racial discrimination and yet race was never formally discussed or brought up on the record because Canada has this colonial desire to be the good guy even when they're clearly the bad guy and this is just another example of that. And I, oh. Viola had challenged segregation, okay? And thus the white prioritized and protected social order that they were trying to maintain. So she had to be punished for that in order to set an example for others who may be inspired to do the same. When Henry was interviewed about the incident by the Toronto Star, he said that there was no official segregation policy that stated black people couldn't sit on the floor. He called it customary that black folks sat together on the balcony. Viola's husband, Jack, had actually grown up in New Glasgow, so when his wife came home and told him about everything that had gone down, he wasn't shocked, like at all. He also didn't really seem to care that much. Trash. He wanted her to just drop it. He didn't want her to do anything about it. He didn't want her to rock the boat. He saw racism and segregation as issues that were out of their control. And he didn't see speaking up about it or trying to change things as worth it. He thought that it was just going to cause more trouble than it was worth in the end. He told her to quote unquote, take it to the Lord with a prayer. What did he say? And this is why black women be saying that black men can be some of the weakest links because how are you not going to support your wife in her fight against racial discrimination and wrong being done to her and her name being tarnished obviously it was affecting her but this was such a larger issue at play so she she wasn't trying to hear this she was like i don't i don't like that i don't want to just drop it i don't want to take it to the lord with the prayer because the lord's going to tell me to do something about that and that's what i want to do so she actually went to church leaders after he told her to just drop it and you know sought them out for advice and they encouraged her to take action now the church leaders were not the only one who told her to do something about it the black community heard about what went down and they were standing right behind her in her fight and supporting her in any way that they could the nova scotia association for the advancement of colored peoples raised money for viola to help fight her conviction the clarion and carrie best also supported her in any way that they could as carrie had had a similar experience and she was the owner of nova scotia's first black women owned and operated newspaper which regularly covered social issues for more information on that if you haven't listened to the episode about carrie best go and do that because she's an icon and we love her shortly after viola returned home she was examined by a doctor and that doctor had actually also told her to contact a lawyer to get her charges reversed due to the severity of her injuries so she did just that and that's on a period and she set out in uncharted territories at this point in canadian history no black person had ever successfully won a case fighting against racial segregation and a large part in this was because it wasn't technically segregation because it wasn't like a law so it's hard to fight a law that doesn't really exist. And so they hid their racist policy behind the right for businesses to deny entry. At this point, no court in Nova Scotia had ruled on whether segregation was legal or illegal in public service spaces because they didn't have to address segregation. They would address other things when at the core, the issue was racial segregation. So Viola had actually hired a white lawyer named Frederick Bissett. And based on the precedent and circumstances, Frederick decided that he was not going to take the rights violation angle because he knew that they wouldn't win with this because it was easy to deny in court. He instead filed a civil lawsuit against Henry and the theater. Frederick set out to prove that Henry was acting unlawfully when he called the police and had Viola violently removed. This would mean that she was entitled to compensation for assault, malicious prosecution, and false imprisonment. <laughs> Unfortunately, the lawsuit never went to trial. Frederick nor Viola were about to give up, okay? So he went and applied to the Supreme Court of Canada to, to have her initial conviction set aside. On January 20th of 1947, Justice Maynard Brown Archibald ruled against Viola, stating that the decision to appeal should have been applied to the county court. The 10-day appeal deadline had long passed, so the conviction stood. Someone get this jigaboo away from me. The Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in Canada, so their ruling stood above what anyone else wanted. There was no way to appeal it after this, 
so they had no choice but to stop pursuing legal action. Frederick did not charge Viola for his time and services. He instead wanted them to use the money that they would have paid him to continue to fight segregation. So Frederick was a real ally, okay? He wasn't just talking about it. He was being about it. In 1954, segregation was legally outlawed in Nova Scotia. And this to me is so ridiculous because how are you going to legally outlaw something if you're claiming that it was never happening? What's not clicking? After the case kind of came to a close, Viola did not speak out publicly about how all of this affected her personally, but her marriage did fall apart because her weak husband did not want her to pursue the case. And Nova Scotia quickly became an unsafe and traumatic reminder of how dirty she had been done. She would go on to abandon her businesses and her school and essentially her home, her whole entire life, before moving to Montreal and then moving again to New York City. Viola died in New York City on February 7th, 1965. Only decades after Viola died did she receive the praise, the awards, and the flowers that she deserved when she was still alive and actively fighting against systemic racism in her home province. And this only happened because her sister, Wanda Robson, began to fight for it. In 2010, Wanda published a book about Viola, her experiences, and everything that she had accomplished named Sister to Courage. On April 15th, 2010, Viola was granted a pardon by the Nova Scotian Lieutenant Governor, Mayan Francis. At this ceremony, Premier Durrell Dexter issued a public apology and said that her charges were a miscarriage of justice and they should have never been laid in the first place, which, yeah, duh. Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs and Economic and Rural Development Percy Paris said that with this pardon, we are acknowledging the wrongdoing of the past. We are reinforcing our stance that discrimination and hate won't be tolerated, which this is so performative because racism and discrimination and hate, they're still tolerated and still perpetuated by the same government that they represent. But we move on. In 2010, Canada Post issued a stamp with her face on it. In February of 2016, a Heritage Minute was released about Viola. In 2017, Viola was inducted into Canada's Walk of Fame. In January of 2018, she was named a Person of National Historic Significance. On November 19th, 2018, the $10 bill featuring her was released, and it was the first vertical bill in Canadian history. And the bill also has an excerpt from the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms on it, which states every individual is equal before and under the law and has right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, which is something that is still not fully applied today. So again, this is very performative. In 2019, the Royal Canadian Mint released its first Black History Month coin with Viola on it, performative as hell. And in February of 2021, the Nova Scotian government repaid an adjusted amount of Viola's fine to her sister. Wanda used the $1,000 to fund a scholarship in her sister's honor. So we have now come to the part of the podcast where I give my thoughts, my feelings, and my opinions on this whole situation, okay? I rock with Viola heavy. I remember the first time I learned about Viola Desmond, I think I was in eighth grade. I was in eighth grade and we got to write two essays on anything that we wanted. And so I was stuck between writing about Africville or writing about Viola Desmond. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of information out there. It was just very much like, yeah, she's the Canadian Rosa Parks. Uh, so at the end of the day is I'm nosy. I find that resources now, a lot of them, obviously not all of them because I used the resources to create this episode, but a lot of them will gloss over the severity of what happened and how it really affected her. Like this is where her family was from. This is where her family grew up. This is where she had her businesses, her, she had her everything. So for this case to go this way and then her husband to leave her, which I'll talk about him in a second, nasty man. He's really terrible. She kind of, she had to abandon everything to just live a life in peace because racism and racial discrimination was a real thing. The KKK was very, 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 very active in this area. So it's very likely that she would have been a target had she remained. That man was the weakest link. I'm gonna just say that. Because if anything like this ever happened to me and I was married and the man was like, you know, I just think you should drop it and just take it to the Lord. Ew. Mm, you see that? I almost threw up. You make me sick. You make me sick. I just cannot. What I'm taking to the Lord is my prayers of divorcing your ass. 
because absolutely not. Absolutely not. How dare you? But I also think this just goes to show how a lot of the times Black women have to bear the brunt of the activists and social justice movements because a lot of Black men or just Black people in general, they're very comfortable, they're very complicit. And so you have those women who push those boundaries, but then people look down on them. Or when it ended the way that it ended, they're very much like, I told you so, rather than being like, you know what, you did everything that you could, and I'm so proud of you, and I love you for that. Imagine how tired we are. It's performative of the Canadian government to be like, we love her, she did all these things, woohoo, she fought for discrimination. Like, systemic racism is still a thing. The thing that Viola was still fighting is still prevalent today. What's not clicking? So it's so disingenuous to be like, yes, we love everything that she did and, you know, like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and woo woo woo, but then no commitment to doing anything about what's still going on, the things that are still being perpetuated, the way that Black folks, specifically Black women, are still being discriminated against. We're just gonna act like that's not a thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's a problem. Also, the Canadian government acts like they just did this off their own free will. If it wasn't for Miss Wanda, okay, advocating for her sister, it's likely a lot of information wouldn't be out there to this day, or she wouldn't have received half the awards that she did. Viola is truly the Canadian Rosa Parks, and she deserves all of the praise and all of the recognition, but I also need the Canadian government to be so for real about what it is that she was fighting and the ways that they are still actively perpetuating those things to this day. So I thank you so much for learning about Viola Desmond with me and I will see you tomorrow for the next Black History episode.